Welcome everyone to CRC Talks. I'm Mary Ann Pearson, Senior Director of Patient Navigation at the Alliance. CRC Talks is a new Alliance program to amplify critical conversations that happen between providers and patients to benefit everyone. We hold CRC Talks every two months on a various topics from treatment, survivorship, plus screening, and everything in between. Watch the Alliance's so social media channels and email letters um, for updates. We're so glad you all could join us today. The after this afternoon's program is brought to you by the generous corporate supporters, Genentech and Natera. Thank you again, Natera and Genentech for your support. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We will reserve some time at the end of the program to answer questions. You can ask your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. Throughout the program, we will conduct polls. Please help guide the conversation by answering the questions. Follow this talk. Following this talk, you will be directed to a short one minute survey. We really appreciate your participant, participation. Finally, to watch this video later, you'll soon find it on bluehq.org, the Alliance's online patient support hub. Now I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, David Fenstermacher, the Alliance's Senior Director of Research and Medical Affairs. As my colleague, I know he is highly motivated biomedical researcher and brings significant expertise to the Alliance and our community. Thank you for being here, David. Thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be here. So yeah. uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. So today's topic is to talk about clinical trials. And I know they can be a rather undaunting topic for a lot of people. Uh, so let's get into it and let's uh, talk a little bit more about clinical trials and answer any questions that you may have. The first thing I'm gonna, we're gonna hopefully see if this works. I'm gonna share my screen and see if we can play a video. So just hold on one second and we will see if we can get this to work. trials are research studies that test whether a new drug is safe and works well. All medicines that you can get today were studied in clinical trials. Most of the time, a clinical trial compares a new medication to one that is already being used for treatment. You will almost never receive a placebo, a drug that looks like a real treatment but isn't, on a cancer clinical trial. Rest assured, a team of medical experts closely watches people who join the clinical trial and you can leave a clinical trial at any time. You might also get paid to participate in a trial to help cover gas, food, and lodging costs. And of course, you can ask your doctor if a clinical trial is right for you. The Colorectal Cancer Alliance can help you learn more about clinical trials and find active trials based on your specific colorectal cancer diagnosis and or your biomarker test results. Moreover, the Alliance has a skilled team of patient navigators ready to help. Just call our toll-free helpline at 877-422-2030 to connect, learn more, and explore trials that might be right for you. Again, that number is 877-422-2030. Okay, so hopefully that went okay. I think everyone indicated it did. All right, fantastic. So now I'm going to go to a presentation and share that. Can everyone see my screen? I'm seeing nods. Excellent. Okay. So there we go. So we're going to talk about clinical trials today. Yeah, let me just move on. And so the overview of the talk is going to be Clinical Trials 101. We're going to discuss what clinical trials are and what they are not. Uh, so there are many myths uh, out there about clinical trials, but you know, all, also a lot of great facts that can certainly help you make a decision about whether a clinical trial would be right for you. Uh, what are the different types of clinical trials? Most people are very uh, knowledgeable about what is called an interventional trial, meaning with a particular drug. Uh, or intervention, but there are many other types of trials that also you can participate in, uh, and we'll explain some of those. We'll talk about the risk and benefits of participating in a clinical trial, why biomarkers are becoming more and more important uh, in clinical trials, and then basically, as you have this information and you're talking to your oncologist, 
what are the important things to ask uh, about possibly participating in a clinical trial, whether interventional or not? That was what we just watched. So, okay. So clinical trials are a type of medical research. So any drug you have ever taken in your life, uh, anything that is over the counter today, or, or that you have to get prescription has gone through the clinical trial process at one time or another. And this really is allowing us to test the most cutting edge therapies that are currently out there. Uh, and you know, cancer is a very devastating disease. And so one of the main efforts at many of the pharmaceutical and biotech companies is to really make sure that they are coming out with new and effective treatments of four different cancer diagnoses. Uh, the clinical trials, again, are the first point of testing. So I used to work at a pharmaceutical company and you know we did a lot of research that was called preclinical research. And that was done on cell lines or even on uh, animals to determine, number one, would the drug actually work for a particular disease? Number two, it, would it have uh, any side effects? Uh, with that particular drug in the in the animals or in the cell line. So doing a lot of biology up front before it even gets to the point where they would even introduce it into a human subject. And so trials developing many promising options for patients by providing new treatments. Uh, vaccines are becoming extremely popular in, in oncology uh, research and treatment today, uh, not just trying to uh, stop current uh, tumors, but also trying to prevent uh, the onset of metastatic tumors in the future. Of course, biologics plays a huge role. Biologics are things like antibodies, uh, but also can be cellular therapy uh, that are used to target your immune system primarily uh, and really try to make your own body try to fight the cancer. Of course, other types of clinical trials you'll see are surgery trials. So are there certain advantages over particular surgery today versus a new standard of surgery? Many times this has to do with robotics and other technologies. Uh, of course, devices uh, and you know anything that has to do with a device, uh, whether it be for your heart or otherwise, they, they go through clinical trials. And of course, new combinations of treatments. Uh, so if you have uh, two treatments that have been used separately and you want to combine those, Again, you have to run a clinical trial. And this has become the standard by the FDA and all of the regulatory bodies across the world for basically approval of treatments or therapies uh, that help to alleviate disease. So prior to clinical trials, experiment and testing is done, like I said, in labs and animals. And the trial participation is always voluntary. I think this is one of the things that people get confused about. You are in control of whether you want to participate in a clinical trial or not, and it is totally voluntary. Even if you decide today that you would like to participate, sign up for the clinical trial or are accepted to the clinical trial, at any day during the time you're on that clinical trial, you can stop being on that clinical trial. It is totally up to you whether you participate or not. Uh, cancer trials differ slightly from other clinical trials you may hear about. Because cancer, again, is a very aggressive disease, and many of the trials you hear about, say, with diabetes or heart disease, some of these studies can go for years and years and involve tens of thousands of patients. With cancer, it's a little different, and things are a little bit more streamlined, mainly because, number one, you don't have the large group of patients that may be afflicted with the disease, and two, you're trying to move drugs and therapies that are effective in cancer more quickly to the patient. And so there is some alterations to the clinical trials, but basically it's the same, uh, whether it be cancer or other diseases. And the one thing that is definitely different about cl clinical trials in cancer is you will never get a placebo. That does happen in other trials in other diseases, but basically in cancer, that is not the case. What you would get would be the standard of care for that particular diagnosis that you have instead of the experimental treatment. So you may get the experimental treatment, but you may not, and you wouldn't know that. But the worst you would get would be 
the standard of care. And I really want to emphasize that because that is one of the big misconceptions is that you could not get any treatment at all. And that is ethically not uh, good. And so of course your physician and oncologist would never do that. There are different kinds of designs uh, that we get into clinical trials. And I just want to talk about kind of the difference between interventional and non-interventional. So if it's a non-interventional trial, this is generally also referred to as observational. So this may be a survey that you're asked to complete. Uh, it may be uh, an epidemiological study where they are looking at, say, your DNA in relationship to your disease to see if there's any genetic markers that may help predict what a people that may have that disease. And this has been going on for many, many years. And so when you look at the observation, you'll say, are the comparisons groups? And if yes, that's an analytical study. And so you want to have basically your case, your uh, those folks that would be, say, afflicted with a disease, and your controls, those that are not, do not have the disease, and basically do a comparison against those two groups. If you don't have a comparison group, again, this would be a descriptive study. And so this would be, again, like a survey where we would get information from patients, but it would basically be very descriptive about the patient population or the population in general that we were targeting for that particular survey. On the other hand, if it's interventional, this means that it's truly experimental. And you would generally go through what is called a random allocation or randomization of within this particular study. Wow. And so if you look over at the high level overview, you're basically first assessed for eligibility. And we'll talk about that in a second. How are you access, assessed to be eligible for a clinical trial? Some patients are excluded based on those criteria, but those that do pass the criteria then are randomized. Randomized means you do not know whether or not you are going to get the intervention, the experimental treatment, or the standard of care. And there are several different ways of doing this. One is called blinded. A blinded study means the patient does not know. Why would we not want the patient to know? If the patient knows that they're on an experimental intervention or if they're on standard of care, they may change their behavior based on their thought of what treatment they were on or even their habits of what, you know, that they would change. And so we don't want that to happen because that adds confounding problems to the analysis. And so we want to make sure that the patients are not necessarily aware of which treatment they're getting. If it's double-blinded, that means that their oncologist, who is overseeing the trial for them, uh, and the patient, neither of them know if they are getting the standard of care or the treatment option. And if it's triple-blinded, that means that neither the patient nor the oncologist nor the statistician analyzing the data downstream of the clinical trial is aware of what treatment uh, the patient actually received. And so there are very ways to blind the data so that you don't add bias into the data, therefore adding bias into your analysis and possibly doing some harm down the road. There are also several phases of clinical trials. So as we talked about, you start out with preclinical laboratory studies. That can go on for years. Uh, within a pharmaceutical company to really demonstrate, again, efficacy of the drug or the intervention, as well as safety, which is extremely important. I showed that there are four phases of clinical trials, and this is generally the case. You may hear of something called a phase zero trial. They do exist, uh, but they are rare, and they're generally used in healthy patients to assess uh, tolerable doses, and if there are any side effects with those doses before they go into patients that actually have the disease. But again, they're not used that often, but they do exist. The main entry into clinical trials is called a phase one, and this really is looking at mainly safety. So what you tend to do in a phase one trial is go through what they call a dose escalation, where whatever the drug is, they will increase the dosage over time, uh, in small increments to see, number one, is what is the safety profile? So are you having what are called adverse events? Uh, that could be you know, nausea, uh, fatigue, many different types of uh, adverse events. 
as, as well as, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, I'll get back to that. So uh, it, it's really about evaluating the safety and looking at, again, uh, the, the uh, adverse events. But the interesting thing in phase one, especially in cancer, is, is that many times you'll start to see as you are escalating the dose that you're getting to a dose that actually is having an effect on the disease itself, such as possibly tumor regression. So very important in phase one, not just to understand the safety profile, but also see if there is some efficacy. And you will see some breakdowns into phase 1A, 1B. These are just different stages moving more and more towards understanding efficacy of the drug in a very small population. Could be just tens of people. When you move to phase two, that means basically you've passed phase one. And so now you're really looking again at safety and dosing in the population and possibly several populations. Again, there is phase 2A and phase 2B, moving just getting in, into populations that have a particular disease uh, that are going to benefit from these drugs. And many times, once you complete phase two, which further evaluates the safety, monitors the side effects, really understands what is the dose that is going to be effective in treating the cancer, but also a dose that is going to be effective in not creating adverse events. And so it's really that trade-off between the two. And many times, because of the efficacy that drugs are, see during even a phase two trial, they can be fast-tracked through the FDA and get approval to go into humans for uh, regular treatment or standard of care uh, based on the phase two data itself. Now, a phase three, again, you pass phase two, you go to phase three. This is a much larger population where phase two could be a couple of hundred people. Phase three are going to be several hundred people, maybe even up to a thousand in cancer. Uh, and again, you're really looking at safety and e efficacy and generally also looking a little bit broader across your population, uh, such as other things such as comorbidities may not play as important of a role in your inclusion exclusion criteria so that you're assessing the drug in, with other uh, diseases that people may have other than the targeted disease the drug is for. Once you pass phase three, uh, basically the drug is on the market. It's fully approved by the FDA. As, as I said, it could be approved after phase two. But then most drugs go into a phase four, which is post-marketing, always looking at safety and efficacy of the drug as it gets into broader and broader populations. Remember, clinical trials are very small numbers of people, generally, in cancer, with phase three not exceeding 1,000. Once you release these drugs into the general population in the United States or even worldwide, you get a much better idea of what these drugs do in a much more general population globally. Some things you may hear uh, are things such as a basket trial. Uh, basically, basket trials are a single drug that you can use on multiple diseases. So you may have a drug that really looks like it's very effective in say non-small cell lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. And so you wanna try this one drug on the different cancers. Many times it's because of what we would call a targeted intervention or a biomarker, which we will talk about a little later. But these are new designs that have come out over the past couple of decades that really help to achieve moving those drugs much faster through the clinical trial pipeline and making decisions very quickly about whether the drugs or the interventions are going to be a benefit or not. Failing fast is a good thing in uh, the drug manufacturing and drug research world. Uh, putting a drug out there for long periods of time gets more and more costly. And so designing these trials the right way is extremely important. Another type of trial that you may hear about is called an umbrella trial. This is really when you have one drug and you're looking at uh, a single disease, but the single disease is across, say, multiple biomarkers. And so you're looking at it so to see which biomarkers it will be effective with, which ones it will not. And these are very common uh, uh, types of trials that you will basically see in CRC right now. I know this is messy. It's long. I'm not going to go into all of it. But you may say, well, how do I know if I'm eligible for a clinical trial? And you may be surprised by this, but I picked this particular trial 
Uh, this is a KRAS uh, trial that basically if you have 12 or G12C mutant, uh, if you don't know what that means, we'll go into it a little bit later, uh, that uh, basically you may get a lot of benefit from this particular drug. And so these are your inclusion criteria. You have to be an adult patient uh, with this particular mutation in your KRAS protein uh, that you have in your cells. You have to have a performance status of zero or one. And you might say, well, what is that? That's an assessment that your oncologist will make about your overall health. So if you're zero, you are extremely healthy. Uh, you don't have any major problems. If you're one, you may have some deleterious effects of the disease you're having, but still overall very healthy. Uh, you have to have measurable lesions as defined by rhesus. This is a criteria used when your uh, imaging is done on, say, your liver or your lungs, looking at the tumors themselves and then measuring the size of those tumors. Uh, and then you have to have uh, prior treatment with a KRAS inhibitor. So these are just the things that they look at. The occlusion criteria, I'm not going to go through them all. But again, you can read them and you can see that this is a very small number of inclusion exclusion criteria compared to what most trials have. Most trials would double or triple these criteria. And you have to basically be able to say, yeah, check the boxes to be able to be eligible for these trials. So one thing while you're searching for trials is to understand what are the inclusion exclusion criteria so that you know if you possibly would qualify. If you don't think you qualify for 100% of everything that's there, that's okay. The best thing to do is look and say, look, I qualify for a lot of this. I should talk to my oncologist to get more information if I would be eligible for this or other trials. Okay, so that's kind of trials themselves. Uh, let's talk a little bit just about the types. First of all, treatment or interventional trials. Again, this is what most people are familiar with uh, when you think about a clinical trial because it's directly uh, putting forth a treatment or an intervention based on your disease for, you know, for that disease. So it's really all about uh, trying to treat your disease with new therapies. And they're designed to ask, answer very, very specific questions. As an example, uh, many times the primary endpoint for a clinical trial will be to increase overall survival or progression-free survival by some amount of time. That could be six months, it could be a year, whatever that might be. But really they're looking at, can they push the boundaries of overall survival or progression-free survival based on the use of this new intervention or treatment? Okay. And again, this can include many types of treatments. So drugs, very common, vaccines, uh, surgery, radiology or radiotherapy, all of these treatments have to go through, through clinical trials to make sure that they are effective and also provide the least amount of harm uh, to the patients. So that's a treatment or interventional trial. There are supportive and palliative care trials. These trials look at ways to improve the quality of life in cancer patients. So if you are afflicted with cancer, you know that there are many things that now are affecting your life in very particular ways. And so are there things that can be done to help the quality of life in these cancer patients. And so it's really tends to be focused a lot on the side effects that you get from treatment, uh, but you will all see all, you'll see all sorts of support and palliative care. Some of it is for mental uh, care uh, and support. Many of it is around, are there other say uh, uh, drugs or other interventions that are not necessarily part of the pharmaceutical world uh, that also could be used, so natural uh, things, uh, vitamins, those sorts of things. And so, you know, these really look at very different things and how people can uh, basically benefit from various types of treatments. Prevention trials. These are really trials that are really trying to decide who is at risk for a particular disease and who is not. So one of the types of, of experiments that have been done or research that's been done for a number of years are called genome-wide association studies, where the researchers are looking for those that have a particular disease or cancer and those that do not, and then looking to see if there are any markers in your genetic code that would basically 
tell us if you are predispositioned in some way to be able to or to get that cancer or that particular disease. Uh, and a, a classic example outside of cancer is Huntington's disease, where there is a genetic test to determine whether or not you will contract that in your 40s, basically. Uh, and it's a very accurate uh, test. What we're trying to do is do the same kind of testing for cancer. The interesting thing uh, right now is the fact that there are some just wonderful things coming out uh, in cancer research that really are for the early detection of cancer. And these tests are going through prevention trials right now. Understanding, can they detect cancer before you would ever see it in imaging or actually you know, in palpitating uh, a tumor, uh, anything like that. You would see it when it was just molecular and you would basically not even know you had it. These are exciting times and we hope to see many of these tests go through these prevention trials right now and in the near future. And hopefully many of these technologies will be introduced to all of us to be able to take advantage of this early detection methodology in the near future. Uh, screening trials uh, really is to find cancer early and when it may and when it's more treatable. So if you're familiar with colorectal cancer, you know that we as an organization really try to get people screened uh, as early as possible, especially as the regulations of now say you should be getting screened as early as 45 years of age. Now this screening always does not have to uh, involve the gold standard, which is a colonoscopy but can involve other types of tests, such as a FIT test, which is looking for blood uh, in your stool, also looking for uh, biomarkers in your stool for uh, other types of tests uh, that are available, like Cologuard. Uh, and so you know, there are many ways to screen to understand if people have cancer. The earlier we can find cancer, and this is true in colorectal cancer as well as many other kinds of cancer, is the more treatable it is. And so the faster we can find it, the better off the patients will be. And so screening trials are extremely important and especially understanding how new technologies that are being introduced around biomarkers in stool or around biomarkers in blood can really detect not just what cancer you have or what, that you have cancer, excuse me, but where the cancer is actually coming from. And so again, very exciting uh, screening trials that are going on and hopefully more to come in the near future on new technologies that will be hopefully introduced to the community. So let's talk a little bit about risks versus benefits. First of all, the, if you decide that you would be interested in a clinical trial and you talk to your oncologist, the for, first thing you're gonna be asked to do is to sign an informed consent. The informed consent is a document that basically lays out everything that will happen during the clinical trial, as far as what your treatments will be, how often they will be, what your uh, schedule will be, coming in for infusions or other uh, types of visits. Also, what you will have to do as far as, say, extra CT scans or PET scans uh, throughout the trial to basically assess what, how the drug is doing in your particular situation. It also goes over how the data will be analyzed in the trial and who will have access to that data. They, you can ask questions. Uh, there should be someone there that can basically very knowledgeable about the trial and be able to help you understand all of the language that's there. It can be a little undaunting, but generally they try to keep the language fairly simple uh, and so that you can understand it. And again, you have the opportunity to ask questions. You don't have to sign until you fully understand the informed consent. Uh, once you basically are on the trial, you are closely monitored for potential problems. So many times we tell people, you're gonna get the best treatment of your life on a clinical trial than you ever had because you are so doted over. Uh, they really wanna make sure, number one, you're not having any adverse events. They want to make sure that, you know, if you're having negative results, you discontinue or alter dosage. Uh, they want to make sure that, you know, they're, they're really looking at the progression of your disease to see if there's any effect or not, and if not, get you off of it. So there is so much that they are monitoring, both from a laboratory perspective, imaging perspective, that really you're going to get the best treatment ever. Some patients don't want that, but 
Uh, certainly in the case of many of the new treatments that are coming out in cancer that are very targeted for uh, specific mutations in your genome, these are becoming extremely exciting. And so you know, the potential is there to really take great benefit uh, from these clinical trials and you know, really getting new treatments uh, in, in your hand. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, patients can leave a trial anytime. So if you feel that you, you know, the, the treatment is not right for you, uh, maybe the adverse events are just too strong and they're not able to control them with other treatments, you have the right to leave the, treat, or leave the trial at any time. And so you really get a lot of benefits and the risks are minor, fairly minor, simply because they have to tell you everything up front about what is going to happen in the trial. So again, risk, we have side effects. Uh, they are gonna, they happen. These are new compounds generally, whether they be a biologic, like an antibody, or they be a small molecule. Uh, you're gonna, these are new in humans. So the potential risk for taking these drugs is serious and can be life-threatening. So that has to be really taken into account. You may not directly benefit from the trial. As we discussed earlier, you may get standard of care and may not get experimental treatment. This is necessary to really assess on a one-to-one -one basis during that trial what is happening to patients with the disease or without the disease. And see, that's very, very important. Or in the case of cancer, you both have the disease, but one's getting standard of care and the other is getting the experimental treatment. The other thing you may need to know is you may need to travel. So unfortunately, clinical trials, and this is changing, but are not what we call decentralized, meaning they can occur anywhere. There are some, there are some breakthroughs now that are changing that, but still the majority of trials are available at major academic medical centers, major hospital systems, and so therefore you may have significant travel time to be able to take advantage of a clinical trial. The other thing you have to realize is that while the clinical trial drug costs are covered by the research sponsor, meaning the pharmaceutical or biotech company, routine procedures need to be covered under your insurance. As an example, if you would go through a standard imaging pro process through just your normal assessing where your cancer is, your insurance will still have to pay for that. But if the pharmaceutical company comes in and says, we are requiring three additional CT scans while you're on the clinical trial over this time period, they would pay for that in addition to the drug cost itself. But anything else, even related to say an adverse event, so you became nauseous and needed a drug for the nausea, your insurance company would pick up for that. So even though the clinical trial or the company will pick up some costs for the trial, they do not pick it all up. And so having good insurance will help make sure you reduce the cost that you would have personally for participating in a clinical trial. But what are the benefits? You get to assess the promising new treatments that are out there. And so, you know, many times, you know, you hear, especially cancer patients, my mother uh, was one, and, you know, saying, you know, look, it, it's not about me, it's about helping others. And so you are participating in prom these promising new treatments, getting out to patients. We also help it benefits everyone that's on this call and is participating in the clinical trial. Uh, intensified cancer care incorporates the latest advances in your current standard of care. So you will, like I said, you're gonna see the best treatment you've ever seen. You're gonna be closely monitored by an expert team of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. The nice thing about being on a clinical trial is you are part of a medical team. And so this can include pathologists, radiologists, huge numbers of people that are participating in this trial, all looking at your data to see how you are doing. And then I guess being able to take an active role in your care and ultimately helping others. So it's really, this is what the benefits can be in a clinical trial. So one of the things we talked about earlier are biomarkers and clinical trials. And you're gonna see a lot of this. So the main site that people will generally go to, I go to it, is a place called clinicaltrials.gov. It is a very horrible website. I hate, hate to say that, but it is. Uh, where you can go searching for clinical trials. And number, not many times it's just hard to find what you're looking for. And so you really have to understand how the website is set up 
but there are uh, other uh, things out there, including resources from uh, the Colorectal Cancer Alliance that can help you kind of navigate through the minutia of all of the clinical trials, because there's thousands, if not tens of thousands that are ongoing all of the time. But a subset of these clinical trials, especially in cancer, are really starting to focus on something called biomarkers. And what is a biomarker? And so you may have heard it when I talked a little bit about KRAS earlier. And so KRAS is a protein in your cells that really, when it is altered, so it has a, what we call a mutation, that mutation creates a, a circumstance where that protein is always on. So most proteins have on and offs. This protein is always on. What that does is signal to the rest of the cell that the cell has to continue dividing. So it will divide at an uncontrollable rate. And this is how you get tumors started because these biomarkers are creating a biological effect on the cells that change the characteristics of the cell to become cancerous. And so, and then eventually into a tumor. And so it's very important to understand what are the biomarkers that are responsible for your cancer. And so these are the targeted therapies that now you hear a lot about, one being KRAS, as you might have heard about. BRAF, uh, if you happen to have a BRAF mutation, there are drugs out there that uh, specifically target the BRAF mutation. There are also other types of biomarkers. So one of the uh, things that you know about biomarkers, uh, if you're a male, you certainly know uh, your PSA uh, level uh, for your prostate, but you also have a CAE for uh, CRC, where that can, that's a biomarker that is in your blood that is elevated, may indicate that you are having uh, basically CRC indications. And so biomarkers can help in a lot of different ways. Sometimes they really are focused on targeted therapies. Another example, just to get into a couple things, is uh, if you are what is called MSS high or microsatellite stable high, or the other way to say it is microsatellite instability. If you have that, generally that indicates that you may be more responsive to immunotherapies. And so you could get on something like Keytruda, which is a PDL1 or no, it's PD1, excuse me, PD1 inhibitor. Uh, and so it, it opens up the doors to other therapeutic options that you may have available. So understanding your biomarkers is extremely important. Biomarkers can be DNA, proteins, genetic mutations. They can come from blood, tissue, the tumor itself, or even other body fluids. And we are more and more understanding the biomarkers that are related to not just cancer itself, but specific types of cancer, as well as other diseases. And so when we start doing research into interventions and drugs, Within these diseases, of course, these biomarkers become a central part of where the research starts so that we can truly get to those entities, DNA proteins, uh, that are actually creating the disease state itself. So very exciting to understand biomarkers. For biomarkers in colorectal cancer, everyone should have their biomarkers tested. Right now, if you are stage three or four, you will be able to get biomarker testing, not just pathological biomarker testing, but what's also called next generation sequence testing, which really looks at the genetic makeup of your tumor cells themselves so that we understand what are what we call driver mutations, those mutations in your DNA that are actually causing the cancer disease itself. And if we can if we know what you have as far as the biomarkers, again, there could be targeted therapies that are available to you that if you didn't have the biomarker testing done, could not be used. So anytime you're talking to an oncologist and you're talking about uh, your tumor, please ask about biomarker testing and get the most sophisticated biomarker testing you have available to you and that your insurance would reimburse you for. Uh, I think I just said a lot of this. Um, again, knowing your biomarker status will help, help you understanding your tumor, but also it under, helps you understand, and I did miss this point, your inherited mutations. So you may 
uh, have, say, a BRCA1, BRCA2. These are fairly unknown uh, by most population. There are basically predispositions if you have mutations in these two genes for either breast or breast and ovarian cancer. There are also genes in CRC that we know provide unique characteristics or inherited mutations uh, that might uh, suggest an onset of CRC uh, in the future. So very important, not just to get your tumor done, but also looking at your germline or your blood DNA so that you understand if there's any mutations you may inherit uh, to your offspring downstream. So also biomarkers will also help you and your doctor decide like on the most effective treatment as we had talked about before. So again, get your biomarkers tested. I'm a molecular biologist. I'm passionate about this. Uh, I've been using biomarker testing for patients for years when I've worked at comprehensive cancer centers. And I just believe it's so important for everyone to make sure that you get this done on your tumor samples so that you understand the biology of your own cancer. So what should you ask your doctor? You might want to talk to them and the medical team about what options there may be for a clinical trial, especially considering the biology of your cancer. And that's why it is so important to get the biomarkers done. It often helps bring a family member or friend along for the discussion. I can't tell you how many times that my mother and I would sit in the oncologist's office and she would they would go over everything with her. And two minutes after we left the office, she'd be like, could you tell me what they talked about with this, you know, with my treatment and when is that going to be done? And so it really helps to have someone with you who can take notes, uh, but also someone there that can ask questions that you may forget to ask. It, it's a very challenging time uh, when you're going through initial cancer treatment. Plan your discussion in writing up in advance so that you have it uh, and you know what to cover. And consider recording the discussion. I never did that. Uh, of course, maybe the technology wasn't as great back then to do that. Uh, but certainly that would be a help if you have that opportunity to really under be able to go back and understand what you were being told about the clinical trial, about your treatment, or any part of your cancer care. Here are just some examples. Uh, you know, what types of clinical trials are available? Again, we talked about they're not all interventional uh, interventional or treatment trials. You may want to take a part in a screening trial. You may want to take part in uh, a, a more of a palliative care uh, trial. And so those are also available and possibly even available in your area, as many of those trials can be done more through uh, remote access and not necessarily having to be at a particular institution. Uh, you know, please ask, as we talked about, what are your what are the inclusion exclusion criteria and would you be a good candidate? Uh, it can get very undaunting to look at those lists of inclusion exclusion criteria. Work with your oncologist to go through it is the best way to understand not just what you what a particular trial you might be interested in or avail or eligible for, but trials coming down the road. What is the eligibility criteria you should really should be looking for in the future? Uh, how do the tests in the trial compare with those uh, you had outside the trial? So it's really, you know, you, you think about, well, I'm going to go through imaging, I'm going to have to go through blood tests, I'm going to have to go through all of these different tests as I'm going through my standard of care. How much more am I going to get if I go on a clinical trial? And so that's very important to understand exactly the additional types of health care interventions you're going to have to deal with by being on a trial compared to the standard of care. Uh, will you be able to take your regular med medications during the trial? Generally, if, and this is just general, you can ask the question certainly, but generally if it's not part of the exclusion criteria, uh, they are not indicating that a particular medication, say for diabetes, heart disease, cholesterol, uh, may be a factor in being excluded from the trial. But again, ask your healthcare professional. Um, will I have my medical care and who will be in charge of my medical care? You know, make sure you know who the PI or what we call principal investigator of the trial is and who's really going to be that central person you contact about your care, not just standard of care, but while on the trial. Uh, you might want to ask why you want to participate. Uh, certainly, you know, they might be able to tell you a little bit more about the science and really why this is something that you may want to take advantage of. Uh, am I willing to participate if I'm not getting the new treatment? 
again, you're going to be blinded to this, so you will not know if you get the new treatment or if you're getting standard of care. Uh, these are standard designs to really prove if a treatment is really working, and so unfortunately, you wouldn't know that. Uh, do I want to participate even if I do not benefit? That's totally up to you. And again, like I said, you can choose to participate or not participate in a trial. Do you understand the risk benefits and that you can opt out any time? And do I have the time and resources to participate? This is always extremely important, again, with travel time, but also with the extra medical care that you may receive being on the clinical trial that may eat into your personal time and therefore might affect uh, your life in general. So above and beyond the disease you already have. So that was a lot of information. Uh, you can find more clinical trials information at our website. Uh, we also have a helpline of navigators that can help you understand the clinical trial finder and how you can understand your results. Uh, and hopefully, you know, going on to Blue HQ and the rest of our website, uh, you'll be able to take advantage of resources we have available that will help hopefully give you more information about clinical trials and may give you an option to think about possibly participating in clinical research. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was so good. I think you answered a lot of questions that came across um, in your presentation, but we have a couple really good ones that I'd like to, to bring to you. And the first one is, um, we know that clinical trials should include concerns about quality of life as well as length of life. How important is it to report out adverse effects and quality of life issues? Many of us are afraid to report adverse effect due to be taken off the trial. That's a really, really good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to me, you want to report anything. Uh, quality of life is very important. One of the things that is becoming standard in clinical trial design is making sure that not just the effectiveness of the drug in extending life, but that the quality of life is also improved. Well, that might be the wrong word, but it is also there, right? It, so more and more trials are being written in to have endpoints where they actually are looking at quality of life endpoints rather than just the efficacy endpoints. And so I think that's really important. It's also really important. I don't, you know, for a quality of life issue, you know, as an example. So if you're on an EGFR inhibitor, one of, one of the side effects of those can be a very extreme rash. And that rash can get so extreme that many patients decide to stop the treatment uh, because the rash is, is very, uh, very strong, right? Yeah, that's an adverse event but it's also a big quality of life because you might be able to put up with the itching, but it might have other deleterious effects to your quality of life that, you know, you want to make sure that the pharmaceutical company is aware of. Uh, you know, they're not there to like basically just take you off of something because you're having, you're experiencing something that's uncomfortable, but at the same time, they want to make sure they understand everything that's happening, not just uh, with respect to fighting your cancer, but mentally, physically, anything like that. Uh, very important. Uh, and really talk to your research coordinators if you're on a clinical trial about any of those adverse events you would be having. I can't hear you, Marianne. You're mute. I said some really good things, David. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really um, great um, explanation. Um, another question is, are all clinical trials for stage three and four patients only? No, not at all. Uh, as an, I'll, I'll give you an example of one. I think it's really a novel clinical trial. This is out of a company. You, I can say this. It's all public knowledge. Uh, it, it's called BioNTech. So they are the makers of the COVID-19 vaccine that Pfizer uh, distributed. And they basically, for if you are stage one, or stage two, it's mainly stage two because generally we can't get enough biological material out of stage one. But if you're stage two, they will take some of that tumor, the cells from your tumor, they will sequence them using what's called next generation sequencing. So we'll look at the, the structure of your DNA 
and they will create vaccines to what we call, oh boy, uh, they will make vaccines to cell surface proteins that are specific to your cancer. And then they will inject that into you. And the idea is, is after you do a, a resection of your stage two cancer, that if there is going to be a recurrence due to a metastasis or even a recurrence in the colon, that you will now have generated antibodies that will recognize particular proteins on cancer cells and will allow your immune system to destroy the cancer cells before they would even develop into a tumor. And so yeah, that's just one example wow. of a stage two trial that is currently out there and running. And you know, it's gonna be very interesting to see the results of these types of trials. But yes, uh, there are trials for phase one through phase four cancers. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and that just reminds me of just, do you have any tips about how, if you haven't been, if clinical trials have not been brought up by your doctor to you, do you, do you have a specific approach that a, pa a patient should ask certain questions or how do you think they should address their doctor around that? Yeah, I, I would simply ask, you know, I, you know, cause you're probably going to get the standard of care, uh, right. information from your oncologist. Uh, so, uh, just as an example, uh, well, we think we should get you on full Fox uh, as quickly as possible. Okay. My question to my oncologist would be, are there any possible experimental treatments that are out there that would be good for my type of cancer? Okay. And if, you know, the, if the question back or, well, if the comment back from the doctor is, well, what do you mean by your type of cancer? My first thing would be then, well, then we should be doing biomarker testing to yeah. understand is Folfox actually going to be the best treatment for me? You have to remember with some of these experimental drugs, part of the exclusion criteria for trials is the fact you've had systematic chemotherapy first line. And so you don't get the opportunity to take some of these targeted therapies. I think this will change, but this is the way the trials are written right now such that you know, if you immediately go on chemotherapy, you may not be eligible for targeted therapies or other immunotherapies, that sort of thing. And so it's really, again, understand your biology and talk to your doctor. And if they don't come back with very succinct answers around, yes, there are other treatments, then just probe a little bit so that you make sure that you get your cancer diagnosed the way it needs to be so that if there is a trial available, you might have access to it. That's great. I'm so glad you emphasized the biomarker testing. I think that confuses a lot of our patients and and um, family members. If they, if our patients or a patient out there doesn't know what their biomarker is, or if they even got tested, how could they obtain their reports? Like, how do they go about getting that information? Sure. So, if you had a, a biopsy or a uh, resection uh, of a tumor. Uh, the institution that did the biopsy or the resection is required to keep a sample for 10 years. Uh, so, right. no. so they, and they have to keep it. So if they did biomarker testing, yes, you could basically ask for a pathology report. And in particular, I would ask for a molecular pathology right. report. That would have information on what biomarker testing was done. And again, biomarker testing does not mean DNA sequencing. That's also a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can do tests in the pathology lab that will look for biomarkers also. Uh, but you know, it, if you do not see the type of biomarker testing that needs done, say KRAS mutations, BRAF mutations, uh, BRCA mutations, uh, then you know the DNA sequencing hasn't been done. Okay. You can ask them to take that sample that they have stored and ship it to a company that they generally use. And admittedly, some cancer centers, especially cancer centers, have their own labs that can do this. They don't have to send it off. But mm -hmm. you know, companies like Foundation Medicine, I'm not promoting them. I'm just mentioning them. Natera is another. Uh, there's there's a lot of them where you can send your sample to, and they will do this type of profiling and get back to you. So if you haven't had it done. Don't despair. 
go to your healthcare provider, ask them to go to the pathologist to get the sample, see if you've had the genetic testing done. And if not, you can get your oncologist to order it. Uh, if you if that doesn't work <laughs> and you either have a recurrence or a metastasis, again, if you have a biopsy or, or again, if it's a recurrence and you have a resection, make sure that it's done on that material. Great. Thank you so much. We have one last question from a participant that says, I just started to participate in the clinical trial. However, I'm in a group receiving triple combination of ATP-128, VSV-GP-128, and BI-75409. How do I know if I'm in a blinded study because they did not mention it? Well, that's a really... Good question. Uh, yeah. I don't know what any of those compounds are. I know. I tried to read it exactly, but at the, the question at the end is the most. Yeah, critical. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So there are trials where you're not blinded. Uh, and let me give you an example of a trial that's not blinded. So uh, a trial, again, this is all public information, not disclosing it, but a trial that uh, is for what we call neoadjuvant. Therapy. So neoadjuvant therapy would be before you have a resection done on a tumor uh, in your colon or your rectum. Okay. And so you know right up front because it's a neoadjuvant that you are getting the treatment. Okay. And these are generally the phase zeros I talked about. And the one I know about actually is a phase zero where they are assessing dosage, yes, and safety, yes. They're still doing it within a population that is looking for resection of going forward. And they just felt that because of the safety profile of this particular treatment, there was no reason to have to have a control group. So every patient on that trial knows they're getting the treatment. So that that is that does happen periodically. Most studies are blinded though. And so... Even if they told you the three drugs, I don't know what, again, what those three drugs are, what that combination is, um, but it might be coded such that it would be hard to figure out. That's what I'm guessing. Although I thank bet you. I could Google it pretty quick and figure it out. So, <laughs> but I, there you. are trials that are that are not blinded. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have um, today for questions. David, thank you so much for all the information. It was so helpful. Um, I just, I want to let everyone know that you could watch this video later. Um, we will be downloading it to bluehq.org and the, um, which is our Alliance online support hub. We, I also want to just remind our, our viewers, um, that we have a helpline that you could talk with a, um, certified patient navigator and get, learn more about clinical trials and get connected to the right resources. And I just wanted to say thank you again, David. This was wonderful. And everyone have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you.